All right, welcome everybody to our um, community live stream on data and dimensionality. Today is a little bit of a different timing. Um, I had some scheduling issues and I had to move the live stream to today, Saturday. Um, but um, other than that, it's a regular one. For those of you joining us for the first time or watching this recording at some point, um, this is our efforts to communicate to the broader community and to the whole world that we are um, progressing in different directions. We have several projects that are ongoing. We have 
uh, summer school that is coming up. This is uh, already officially announced and uh, hopefully we'll be able to tell you more next week or in two weeks time, I guess, um, about tickets and about you know how you can get your place and uh, if you want to get early bird or you want to uh, catch accommodation at a lower price and things like that. So um, that'll be uh, very near in the horizon. Um, further than that, we have um, two workshops coming up uh, in person. So that's uh, Madrid and Amsterdam. Uh, we have to still finalize venues and, and so on, but do expect in the next month or so uh, that a couple of workshops will take place. Um, the Amsterdam one will be a follow-up on what we did a few weeks back on uh, information continuum. So this idea of uh, what exactly is information, how uh, do we perceive information? Is information intrinsic to a medium, etc.? And the one in Madrid uh, is going to be called Culture in Mind. So it's uh, it's going to be a mixture between um, social sciences, neuroscience, data science, uh, maybe a little bit of AI, and so on. So it's basically this phenomenon of culture as some kind of software that is being executed on the hardware that is uh, societies and civilization and things like that. So it's uh, kind of trying to draw analogs all the way from the individual brain and nervous system to the sort of larger scale culture and so on, and trying to find analogs in the sort of structurally and how their systems uh, behave. Um, so that's going to be a local event that's uh, fairly uh, sort of autochthonous from, uh, from, from people from Madrid. But if you happen to be nearby, uh, by all means, feel free to come and it will be live streamed and it will be in English, everyone is welcome. So um, that's pretty much about it. Uh, another thing that I want to remind everyone is that we are getting ready for our funding run, uh, our first ever funding run. Uh, we're going to have a sort of com a component of crowdfunding. We will just make donations available. Donations are always available, but we will make uh, an explicit uh, sort of campaign that has a special uh, sort of conditions and that's hopefully coming in about two or three weeks as well so uh, several things are currently in the pipeline and it's kind of a bottleneck uh, this, this sort of April May time when a lot of things are getting done very quickly uh, but yeah uh, other than that uh, I think we we can move on to community specific stuff uh, that's why uh, I'm very glad to have Anmol here uh, one of our community officers um, and Dugan, who's joining us as a community member, otherwise. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so the main, the main announcements that, that we have to make uh, uh, in the community, well, just to give some, um, some context to people, uh, there's been some lively discussions uh, around uh, philosophy. There's been a lot of, uh, let me bring up the, let me bring up the um, Discord. So we've had a lot of, um, I think social science has been quite heated lately. There's been a lot of uh, debate around, uh, well, open science was mentioned and the sort of general framework of science, how people are thinking about doing research uh, in society and so on. Um, we've had some discussions in philosophy as well, um, in uh, several, uh, several directions. There are echoes of discussions that were happening a few weeks ago on the notion of truth and the notion of uh, sort of what is the purpose of science, is it, is it related to that? And obviously uh, sort of um, um, branching into all these uh, sub-themes of uh, spirituality and uh, consciousness topics and things like that. And uh, as always, I like to highlight our uh, memes uh, section. It's always, uh, you know, the, there's a lot of room for nice banter, but there are some, some nice memes uh, found online, obviously this uh, with the uh, eclipse being uh, part of the news now, and you know, this, this one is a, some, some fish is coming out of the water and say, imagine being ripped out of your comfortable life by a higher being and getting exposed to the glory of the cosmos and then immediately getting, getting put back. So uh, yeah, that's uh, showing the fish, the eclipse with the glasses. Anyway, so it's always a good place to find like random uh, funny stuff. Uh, I recommend that you um, contribute with your own and uh, yeah, pretty funny stuff. Um, but other than that, the main reason why we're here is the bi-weekly themes. So this uh, week, uh, this time, uh, we are going to be covering the last couple of weeks where had, which had a focus on 
uh, data science, uh, dimensionality reduction, this idea of uh, methods from mathematical physics and differential geometry, more specifically applied to data science, applied to LLMs, applied to all these kinds of fields. Um, uh, we, I was taking personally the, the opportunity that uh, Liubov, a uh, collaborator of mine, uh, and uh, a SEMF member uh, was uh, visiting in Madrid, uh, here locally, at the SEMF headquarters, so to speak. And we have a very nice time uh, of collaboration and, uh, you know, doing fun things in Madrid together. And uh, one of the main uh, collaboration points was this idea of data science and how to apply differential geometry concepts to it. So we made it line. So this week, We've had that, and if you go back to the schedule, we you can see that we have how many uh, five dates left, so five uh, biweekly cycles left until um, the months in the summer where we are effectively uh, gearing everything up towards the summer school and uh, sort of the calendar is taken is taken over by summer school interactions. So. In order to fill up at least the uh, next few, uh, with uh, well, Amol has prepared a very nice poll, and maybe uh, Amol, you can walk us through th what the options are and what was kind of the thinking behind them and so on. Uh, yeah. Uh, for some reason, I can't actually see the poll now uh, in the bi-weekly team channel. You cannot see it? No, I, I posted it, I saw it uh, then, but like now it disappeared for me. Um, like, does, does it still, still show for you? I saw two posts and then now I only see one post, so. Yeah, that I I I, um, I deleted one because it was duplicated. You cannot see it at all, the, the one that is... Oh, yeah, I, I think it was duplicated because I actually didn't see the first one either, so I thought like it didn't send, so I send it again, and then I saw it, then I thought like it has been sent, but now it even that is disappeared. So I, you, okay, can you uh, send a screenshot for uh, uh, of it for me? So, so just like uh, for explanation purposes. Yeah, so people are people on YouTube are seeing the the poll because um, it's so you you go to the biweekly theme channel and you don't see the poll. No, I just uh, see the previous message, like chat here live from you, and then cast your votes for the next topics. Oh, that's strange. And Duvin, you can see the, the poll. I see it. I see a poll posted by Anmol. Mm -hmm. um, and it has... That's very strange. You know, people have been voting at the, t at the bottom. That's... That might be some kind of um, when when like I maybe restart Discord. I blame the servers. Yeah, maybe. Yeah, maybe try re restarting. Um, yeah, I've I've had a, I've had a couple of hiccups today. Actually, uh, the event like the, this community live stream event was uh, not showing up for some time. Um, yeah, no, I, I can see your screenshot now. Uh, I'm all, I understand. Um, but yeah, try try resetting. See what happens. Oh yeah, it shows up for me now. Um, hello, Gurnur and. Adin, um, there is a couple of questions. So, um, yeah, summer school will be live streamed. Um, people will be able to participate. Sorry, I think my microphone is awfully far away from my mouth. So I think the sound should be much better now. I think you probably heard me a bit echoey and in the distance before. So, uh, Gurnur, yes, um, you can participate online. Uh, the summer school assumes that people uh, don't necessarily attend the event physically. Now, the event in person, physically in Valencia, has its own tempo. It has a lot of specifics that, that are bound to the fact that we are there in location and we have you know, facilities and we go to the beach and we go to local uh, culinary experiences and you know, dinner and, and so on. Um, so I strongly uh, recommend anyone who can get, uh, who can uh, 
you know, basically cover the cost of travel because the, the, the summer school itself, uh, we, we don't charge. I mean, we, we ticket it so that we can keep track of uh, accommodation organization and uh, we charge a little bit for uh, fresh water and, uh, and some snacks during the week because uh, it's summer in, in Spain and it's, it's very hot. Uh, but other than that, we, uh, we, we don't charge uh, for any of the, any of the activities themselves. Uh, and there's a lot of uh, opportunity for self-organization and so on. So we will make a proper announcement, hopefully in, in one, two weeks maximum. Um, but there is an entire uh, online um, component to the summer school. And uh, the week before the in-person summer school, there's uh, what we call the preschool week. And that's, the, that's fully online. And uh, and all all contributions that uh, are not that are that are not uh, offered in location will be live streamed and, and you could access the the Zoom rooms and things like that. Uh, although there will be some courses that are offered only in person, um, and uh, it's kind of our uh, sort of point of uh, of appeal to for people to come in person. So so yeah, uh, that would be possible. Amol, any updates on seeing the poll? Yeah, I, I see it now. I restarted it. Okay, perfect. Excellent. So, so yeah, maybe you want to go over it, explain a little bit what, uh, what choices. So, uh, this time a few options have been changed. Like uh, many of the previous options have either been uh, relabeled uh, and some of them have been added. So for instance, now we have the category of archaeology. So yeah. technically that would be covered in history, but it has been added as a separate category so as to make a clear distinction between the two. So if you are specifically interested in archaeology, now that's an option. Uh, visual arts, uh, animation has been specified. Uh, and same for interactive arts, it now says gaming specifically. So that's like, a, you could say, a major subsection of those interactive arts we often associated with, uh, associated, uh, it with gaming. And uh, same goes for visual arts. Uh, chemistry is the same as before. Then there's uh, biology. I enabled it as uh, life sciences. So now it covers zoology and uh, botany and other some uh, related stuff apart from this biology. Uh, then uh, cognitive science has been, uh, I, I think, like specified as psychology instead. So maybe uh, you could say that it is can be interpreted as being more specific to human psychology. Then uh, information science, a uh, uh, sub, uh, subdomain of computation. So which was computer science before is now information science because that is something we discuss often here. Uh, then there's complexity, uh, which is the same as before, economy, education. Uh, and then because it, uh, more recently in the philosophy channel, we, we were, uh, as Carlos mentioned, we were discussing the nature of truth and uh, questions like this. So I started specifying metaphysics uh, as a major subdomain. Uh, physics is the same. Ancient history, again, uh, in the sense of information that has been uh, associated with uh, ancient culture uh, as part of history. Then architecture, urban, urban planning is something new. So we didn't have that category before, but I felt that it was important and perhaps we could have some uh, discussions in regards to that. Uh, linguistics is same. Uh, fiction is also added. So now it covers like a broad category of any works, of any creative works, so to speak. Uh, so it was literature before, but uh, you could say that's uh, more generalized. Uh, yeah. Mathematics, music, uh, same as before. Policy making again a major subdomain of politics. Um, and then another new category is the theology and spirituality. So that you could say also has been branched off from the nature of those kind of questions, mm -hmm. which tend to almost bother for uh, border sometimes these regions. Yes. And not to mention the uh, consciousness kind of things, which are heavily experiential in nature. So spirituality might link uh, with that better. So that's a dedicated category now. So these are uh, the options. Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Anul. Uh, that, that was uh, very, very helpful. So how can you uh, vote? Um, there might be some people online that don't know that you can access our community by following the link on the screen. So uh, on the, sorry, on the chat uh, on YouTube, um, that will take you to a page that looks like this, just for everyone to see. I'll show it in the live stream very quickly. Um, it will ask for your name, your email, and uh, some little information about your uh, your background. So, what, uh, how do you describe your occupation? Are you a researcher? Are you a student? Uh, do you work in arts or creation? I mean, just some general alignment in terms of occupation, and then some areas of interest. This is really the only thing that we demand from you, uh, other than a name and a contact email. 
Um, and so once you join, uh, you, get the, uh, you get the option to be subscribed to our mailing list where we make all the relevant announcements. I strongly recommend you stay um, uh, subscribed to the mailing list because we don't send that many emails, maybe once every month or uh, now that the summer school season is coming up, maybe a bit more, but it's usually not spammy at all. And then most importantly, it gives you access to the Discord server. So uh, that way you have, you can enter uh, basically, uh, uh, so it will give you the link, which is uh, only um, behind this uh, registration process, this very light uh, submission process. Um, and then you can access the Discord and the Discord, as you can see here, uh, has many categories. Um, there's a lot of, uh, a lot of conversations going on. There are very informal conversations, as I said in the beginning, but there's also focused, uh, focused groups where we go uh, in, in specific directions and talk, and talk about specific topics. Um, and right now, what I would like to uh, point everywhere, everyone towards is this poll that Emil has been talking about. And uh, I, for example, I personally just uh, voted uh, before the live stream so uh what did it choose b c d so these are animation chemistry and gaming um big fan of uh, animation and gaming myself and i haven't seen chemistry in a long time i'm i'm working with mathematical objects that i call chemoids because there's uh, some uh, there's some analogy there so i want to learn more about chemistry so i voted for chemistry oh i see the numbers uh, ticking so yeah someone voted for q here q is Mathematics, okay, uh, unsurprising. We have a very mathematically inclined community, as many of you might guess. Um, yeah, so uh, we are going to keep this running throughout today's live stream and throughout today's discussion, and we will monitor it in the next few days. Um, uh, but possibly after the end of the discussion, we will get back to it. And if there is some preliminary uh, winners, uh, we might make the, 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 the commitment to the next um, bi-weekly theme directly and uh, maybe the next the, ne the following ones will will wait for a few days until everyone has has the, has had the chance to uh, speak their minds so yeah by all means uh go on the discord uh get voting and uh yeah you're very welcome in our community i don't know if uh Anmol, you wanted to uh, clarify anything uh, i i quite like the addition of um i quite like the addition of some of these categories just to comment on so policy making, I think that's there's a lot of conversations going on in the server about policy making. I guess we live in a very delicate, a very delicate era for many uh, geopolitical issues and uh, economics and things like that. Uh, but then I also like the inclusion of uh, something like architecture and something like theology or spirituality. Now, maybe uh, some uh, clarifications are due here um, when. When we say theology or spirituality, we of, co of course at SEMF uh, we have a very broad uh, range of interests. In some sense, we don't constrain or don't bound uh, where our interests can go. What we constrain is the way in which we approach those those uh, areas or those topics. Um, so uh, there has been some debate, and perhaps it's it's good for me to mention now that we have a more more sort of a sort of slower pace live stream. We, we're not under time pressure of anything until we move on to the discussion. Maybe I can comment on something that uh, it's good that it's out there in, in, in recording, which is um, what constitutes a good SEMF topic? What is what is a valid SEMF topic if anyone wonders? You know, we are multidisciplinary. We say we like all things, but okay. Does it mean that anything goes? You know, is it, is it you know, free for all? Whatever topic I, I have in mind, I can discuss. Well, the answer is, it is a it is a free for all. It is it is uh, anything any topic goes, but not any way to approach that topic. Right. So uh, I'll point everyone to uh, something that has had quite a lot of polish in, in the last few months, which is the the principles to uh, to this. So oh by the way, uh, I'll show everyone the new website because it's just a, has a nice animation. I'll put it on the live stream. So I welcome everyone to go to semf org.es, um, where you'll find all the information about our society. Um, and in particular, we have a new landing page, which uh, has this nice um, motif of the waves and the, and the animation. So uh, you will see all the, all the information here. You'll see about uh, the past school, you'll see about our community, etc. Uh, but most importantly, uh, you might want to learn about our mission. 
So in here, you will find uh, some motivating statements. And in particular, you will, so we break it down essentially as uh, why are we doing this now? What what is the what kind of what are we reacting to? What prompted us to start this this uh, adventure of uh, this society? Um, and then we go on to what principles guide us. Then we set some objectives, the things that we would like to accomplish or do, and uh, or the change we'd like to see in the world, so to speak. Uh, mostly as a direct uh, as a direct reaction to the situations we describe in the why sent now section. And then finally, some concrete actions, some very explicit, you know, um, uh, implementations somehow. So, for example, uh, provide a welcoming platform where scientists, creators, academics, students, enthusiasts uh, can discuss and so on. This is what we're doing right now. We have the Discord, we have this uh, bi-weekly live streams, and we have our events there where everyone is welcome, etc. Um, so I wanted to mention this particular part of the website because if you navigate to principles, you will see that we have these seven um, principles that we give them some, you know, bombastic names uh, uh, like deep analysis, uh, you know, effective communication, equanimity, and th th things like that. But these are intended to give a constrained and pretty high standard bar of of requirement for any treatment of a topic that that is covered. At some. So we we need to uh, counterbalance the um, the. How to say it? We need to counterbalance the inertia that one might have when there's so many different fields, there's so many topics that, are, that could be covered. One needs to counterbalance that inertia with something with with a with a set of guiding principles that allows you to constrain uh, the the kind of things that can that can be discussed. So let me put uh, our faces together with um, this because I want to talk over the principles a little bit. Yeah, okay, I think this is good. Um, so, so these seven principles uh, have, if, I, if this allows me to make it a bit bigger, yeah, oops, anyway, uh, I think that's fine. Um, so just to uh, briefly uh, put in, in recording that uh, any topic is, is, is allowed. So uh, this came to mind because I, I commented on the inclusion of uh, spirituality or theology and uh, things like that in the in the poll for upcoming bi-weekly themes um, and so if anyone wonders oh does it mean that you know people can come and talk about religion or it can or there's also policy making in our list that, oh does it mean that here we're going to have sort of partisan speeches about voting for this or that uh, party or so on um, well the answer to those questions is no as you will see from these principles and uh, and the reason is that we we are strong believers that there shouldn't be a barrier in terms of topics. There, we, sh we should not constrain what, sh it, wh what is to be discussed. That, I think, is unnatural, is, is artificial. I think it's uh, unhealthy even that you say, no, 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 don't go there. You know, don't look in that direction. That, that. But what we say is that if you do go and look into, into topics that might be you know, polemic or sensitive or perhaps a little bit controversial or whatever, um, that you need some strong guidance uh, and some sorry, some strong guidelines to uh, to navigate those uh, murky waters. So just to summarize them very quickly, because I think they're quite effective and they, we can always uh, refer back to them in the future. Um, there's deep analysis. It means that uh, we basically want to go fundamental. So we will not prioritize, for example, uh, review accounts that just give you a bunch of things and just to review many things superficially. We prefer typically to go deeper and to sort of understand structure and, and sort of go into the sort of high tech uh, state of the art understanding of some field instead of uh, just, uh, you know, making some general study of something that is very, very well understood. The other is uh, kind of this is meaning depth and the, the, the other sort of counterpart is, is breadth. And so we refer to holistic integration to the fact that even though you might be very deep into one particular direction, you still need to, you cannot lose track of the context. You need to integrate uh, with where that falls, why is it relevant, uh, you know, if this problem were, this particular problem or, or analytical question were, were to be solved, how would it impact other neighboring areas, areas or in fact any area that might not be directly connected, etc. Uh, the third one, intellectual honesty, is probably the one that is most important when it comes to these topics like, you know, policy making or, or spirituality, theology, things like that, because it says uh, set out clear scientific, analytical or exploratory goals, 
strive for conceptual clarity and critical revision of ideas, independent of extraneous factors such as personal motivations or agendas. So, of course, this is always a, it's a principle. It's a, you know, you, you declare it. It's not, it's not an axiom. You can't really enforce this in any deterministic way. But the expectation is that people enter, enter SEMF and, and come to collaborate with each other with the being primed by this attitude of we are here to figure things out we might disagree fundamentally even and even you know quite passionately about some issues uh, that have to do with you know justice in some sense or in in other ways we, there might be a strong disagreement but because we're here to figure things out and we're here to to make this uh, analytical progress uh, even if that involves doing uh, things that are very much non-analytical I mean involves sort of more experiential embodied practices um, it's very important to keep up that mentality of we are here to work to work together towards no, knowing more than we did yesterday or you know figuring, figuring out this or that or uh, spotting patterns between things that are very distant and things like that. so that's that's the one principle that you can very effectively use to uh, effectively um, or to essentially um, trim out all the undesired noise that would come from pseudoscience and we come from you know more uh, traditional religious uh, uh, irrational fundamentalist kind of all these kind of uh, really bad part in some sense of, of all these phenomena but you can keep the the intellectually super rich and and profound components of it and and of course a lot of traditions in in spiritual traditions and religions and so on around the world have extremely rich intellectual histories and we and they and they appeal to a lot of the very fundamental questions that we are naturally interested on uh, as well so just to say that that that's one principle there uh together with that perhaps effective communication uh in the sense that you you we are demanding a very high bar of clarity from from our from our participants obviously we always try our best we are not always you know lucid to, to be given the best explanations but it is an explicit principle for us you you we want to demand from from our participants from and mostly our speakers um and especially our speakers that they are making an effort to be understood by by uh, by an audience that they understand uh, or by a fairly generally educated audience then of course equanimity just means you know be a nice person <laughs> don't 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 get don't get caught up in uh, personal, you know, ruffles and like uh, all these kinds of things. Just, just be, be compassionate, be respectful, uh, and but uh, be aware that you know sensitive topics might be discussed. And uh, you know, this, this is this is fair game as long as there's there's civil conversation and people are being respectful uh, at a personal level. Then epistemological epistemological transparency is much less well defined, I would say, because uh, it says openly address da data gathering methodologies, sources of information, in interpretative and theoretical frameworks, and possible cognitive biases. So this is essentially just doing science in general. Like it's a, just be be a be a comprehensive scientist. Don't don't fall into your you know pre assumption about a, a metaphysics that is just default and never think about. It. It's kind of you know. Be, be transparent of what you know, we don't know, how you could know it, and, you know, the certainties and, and so on. You know, that's the kind of thing. And, of course, inclusivity. We want to say that if you like the, the six above principles and you, you we, we, there's an understanding that, you know, we are in consonance about them, then you're welcome. We don't care about anything else. We don't care if you're human even. We don't care if you're an AI. We don't care the color of your skin, of course, uh, your, how you pass your time, how you choose your parents. We don't care about anything, anything about that. So everyone is welcome uh, equally in that respect. So just an explanation to because this question has come up a lot in the last few weeks in the private conversations and sort of smaller scale debates. Um, so I thought it would be a good opportunity to just put it here live. Uh, I don't know if I'm will do and do you have any uh, comments or questions about these principles or if you, anything came to mind that you would like to discuss or, uh, or bring up right now. No, all, all that sounds on point. Great. Good to hear. That's always uh, very, very satisfying to hear from uh, an external <laughs> observer. Yeah. Mm -hmm. All right. So I think we, this is about enough um, community stuff. So uh, for people watching, this has always, has always been in the cycle of we first give some updates, uh, talk about a little bit about ourselves, sort of the community, what, what, what we've been up to. And then we move on to talk about the, uh, the the topic of the of the biweekly cycle. So in this case, this is data and dimensionality. 
So maybe I want to give a little bit of context to people. So I'll just make our heads bigger now. Um, the topic of data and dimensionality uh, actually came up because of one of our dearest members, uh, Alex Ospedras, one of, one of the participants in the summer school, a friend of mine who lives actually here next to me in Madrid. And, um, and he, he asked me, okay, I am, he's a neuroscientist, by the way, he's doing a PhD in neuroscience, he has a background in psychology and he's a very multidisciplinary guy. But he was particularly interested uh, in how physics and modern mathematics can really inform the methods of this uh, more data-driven sciences. And so this sparked the interest of several members of our community uh, very quickly. Uh, uh, people working in, uh, in AI, people working in generally in you know, computer science adjacent topics. Um, because we, so we got together and we started to question the foundations of many of these constructions. So for example, when you say, oh, your data is some scatter of points in RN and things like that. These are the kinds of assumptions that even though they make for good, ma well-defined mathematical problems in practice, the foundation of those assumptions might be uh, questionable, meaning it might only apply in certain situations, but not others, and we want to understand exactly when they apply and, and so on. Um, so, so yeah, so that's kind of the context of where we're coming from. We're coming from uh, having a crowd of people who we have quite uh, uh, quite expert uh, people on the data science side. We have people like myself that have a lot of experience on the mathematics and uh, differential different geometry and mathematical physics kind of stuff. And then we have people that are doing science and practic practitioners in other fields like uh, sound design and, and biology and psychology and these kinds of things. So this topic is, is, is meant to be um, somehow addressing this, this, uh, this realm of possibilities. How do we explore um, the, the, the possibilities of modeling data in different ways. How, how do we merge uh, modern mathematics or notions in modern mathematics with, with data analysis and so on? And in particular, this concept of dimensionality and this concept of uh, the, the sort of uh, running analogy that your data points tend to be in some kind of space that is analogous to our 3D Euclidean space that we are familiar with every day. Um, you know, how, how faithful is that? How you know how honest can one be when when you just throw any any uh, any quantity that you can measure in, in your in your experiments or in your uh, data gathering process um how fair is it that you just throw it into some background space that you assume maybe is euclidean or a fine space or something so these are the kinds of questions that that we we've been pondering about so maybe what we could do is uh maybe do then you can express what was in your mind what would you you would like to talk about and we can actually take it from there same with amol i think we get we have a fairly open floor here to discuss as, as much as we want yeah i mean so yeah one thing i've always been curious about is is how um these word embeddings are generated for llms mm -hmm. uh, they have these words that are embedded in really high dimensional space um and you know how do they choose you know like you know how big of a space to put it in and how is it, you know, how it does the learning um, comb through, you know, all this text, this corpus of text, and suss apart, like when words should be um, represented in different dimensions, uh, or you know, or different uh, coordinate vectors. Yeah, no, this is this is a very interesting question. I was reading a paper last week about. Uh, I think it's uh, it was shared on our on our, on our uh, Discord and it was it was mentioned in our private meeting that we had earlier this week. By the way, just for reference, we sometimes do uh, private meetings. These ones are always public. The ones the uh, community live stream, we always make them public or at least initially public. We might then transition into a private room afterwards. But uh, we we uh, we have a, a combination of both public and private, so people can feel comfortable if they don't want to be, you know, permanently on YouTube. Um, so. I was reading this paper um, that I think it was called the a mathematical perspective on transformers or something like that, um, if I remember correctly. Uh, so if you join our Discord, you will you will find it there. Uh, you, you can go to the uh, Multimath Fizz uh, channel and, and and it's over there. Um, but yeah, it was funny because it described. I, I found it interesting because it it described a these models as effectively having variables which are living on a sphere to begin with which for a lot of people in practice means that you just norm kind of uh not normalize but you just uh 
project uh, your uh, your scatter of points down to a to, down to a sphere. That's not something that you can always do, uh, unless one point happens to be exactly in the center of the sphere, which is very unlikely, and you can always right, right. yeah remove. But uh, but yeah, basically you can project everything on a sphere. Um, but what was interesting is that the model assumes that your data is of that nature. So that's something that uh, very visually to me illustrated this idea that. You know the, the practitioners they effectively have a scatter of points in whatever 2000 dimensions or whatever, very high dimensional space um and then they say ah all i have to do is take the you know my my uh, root square roots you know pythagoras theorem in in 2000 dimensions is the same as in two dimensions so once you know it in two you know it in as many as you want so you just normalize its vector by normalize i really mean so take take the take the unit uh, the unit vector on, on that direction. Um, and then you just encode that information. So basically you say, I don't care about how far from, from a given origin these vectors are. And I'm just looking at the, I'm just looking at the sphere. So I find it interesting because the, the paper went on to explain that the model really works on, on just collect, uh, basically a sphere with a scatter of points on it. Um, and mathematically, all the theory is done on, on a sphere and it's uh, all about the round metric on the sphere, geodesics on the sphere, everything is, uh, so you never refer, I mean, I think computationally when they implement, they refer to the ambient space to define distances and things like that. But mathematically, all these points were bound to be contained in a, on a sphere. And I find it quite interesting because it was the first time that I saw a data science, uh, so an explanation of a data science procedure that told me you you are canonically on a sphere right now you're not you're not even thinking that you might be in an ambient space you are on a sphere canonically and and that is very i mean that contrasts with the usual uh expectation that your data lives on a in some kind of cartesian yeah, that's interesting. Of I mean, so it's you don't have to keep track of magnitude in that sense yeah um you can just remember that okay you have a, a vector for this word and a vector for this word and um what matters is how much those vectors agree in their directionality with yeah. each other or or don't agree if they're orthogonal um, yeah i gave the you know it's like an object's uh, color is in one axis and then its size could be in a different axis and you know you can change a well okay we're talking about normed vectors so maybe the size of an object but like its shape it's the the quality of its shape if it's a square mm. or a or an oval or something. I mean, that can be expressed in the one axis and its color can be an independent axis. So you would have orthogonal vectors describing the vector embedding for those two attributes. And um, yeah, I guess it's it's irrelevant in this context in this in the in the case of you know word embeddings that you don't care how much of of a vector how long the vector is for a word. Um, that you can normalize it. Hmm. Like, what, what does it mean to to um, say that this word has this vector embedding, and this other word has the same vector embedding but twice as twice the magnitude? Yeah. Like yeah, it's, I don't know. It's more yeah. Of that word, like. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. not really a, something that you would. That's that's how I understand the LMs, by the way, because my my understanding of transformers is extremely limited. I haven't really delve into their, their architecture or anything like that. But I, I have had some experiences like um, tinkering a little bit with with smaller, sort of more uh, now older models. I, it sounds weird to say older when it's like maybe like three years older or something. But I guess it, this is the nature of the exponential time that we live now. Um, so, so yeah, I, I and so it was it was very clear to me that the the model was basically assigning after after training once it's trained uh it was assigning to each word you assign a vector uh in 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 this in this space um it was interesting that the cosine similarity of vectors by the way cosine similarity effectively is just measuring the angle between between two vectors right. it turns it turns out i mean cosine similarity is quite literally geodesic distance in in the sphere so it's funny that you know, when people think about, oh, should we do cosine similarity or should we do Euclidean distance? Well, it turns out they are the same thing. The difference is whether you're on a sphere or on a Euclidean space, right? If you actually live on a sphere, then your uh, cosine similarity is giving you your 
geodesic distance, which is uh, what you would normally think of the, as the distance between two things more canonically. Um, and so I found it interesting because uh, I was working on, a, I mean, this, this is not so much to do with uh, this uh, d dimensionality, but I was working on, um, there's a very funny thing. Um, I'll tell you here because I think it's relevant. I, I was working on higher order um, cosine similarities. So basically, um, and by the way, this 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 feels almost uh, childish. Uh, so I felt very, very inadequate just doing this because it felt like it was very very silly. But effectively, what you what you can think of is you know when you have cosine similarity, you have to do the dot product of two vectors, right? You can you can just take if they are already assumed to be normalized and living on a on a sphere like a unit sphere, then you just take the dot product. That's their angle, right? That's the angle between them, mm -hmm. um, uh, or I guess the arc arc cosine of this whatever. But you know. Uh, yeah, that's you the, just do a little bit of trig and get get the angle. Yeah. Based on the dot product. Yeah, yeah. But anyway, the cosine of the angle between two. So it's uh, one if they are parallel, if zero if they are orthogonal, and you know everywhere in between. Um, and you can keep track of uh, you know directionality with the sign of the of the product. So it's a very useful algebraic construction, right? It's something that you cap you can compute algebraically in a very fast way because if you express those in components, you just do you know first component times the second the first component plus second component times second component plus, you know, it's very, it's a very ar ar arithmetically simple expression that nonetheless captures this uh, geometry very strongly, you know, this idea of how parallel they are and, you know, are they f mirroring each other? Are they? So I thought, okay, why not just extend the number of vectors that you multiply in the same way? So instead of, you know, because once you do a dot product, you get a scalar, it's no longer a vector. So one, why don't you just say, I have three vectors a, B, C, and then you do, you know, first component of the first one, first component of the, of the second one, first component of the third one, times plus first com second component of the first one, second component of the third, you know, just naively extend the formula that you would write down in, you know, your high school class when you learn about that product for the first time, and just extend it for three factors, four factors, etc. So it turns out that that operation, well, it's a well-defined multilinear operation, blah, 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 has some nice properties. It turns out that that operation is very ill understood. There's very little uh, literature on, on that particular operation. And it, it's uh, an operation that relates to a product that is called the Bhattacharya-Mesner product, which is an open question in, in, in algebra, in ternary algebra, or how, how that product actually behaves and what are the axioms and things like that. So are anyway, you about, I'm sorry, the, what, what product are you talking about the dot product? I'm talking about the ternary dot product. Ternary dot product. Yeah. Oh, so, so this like is the... With three... Yeah. With three vectors? Three vectors. That, 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 that's, so that's A right. times B times C, one plus... Plus. Uh, you, 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 yeah. Okay. Yeah. Same formula, just more factors. Right? Huh. It's a completely naive extension of the formula. It's a almost childish yeah. way of extending the formula. So it's shocking to when it's sh it's shocking when you learn that there's almost no literature on this, and there's good reason for it. It's not just you know people not coming up with this formula because obviously it's not a discovery. It's not a you know you you don't need to be a genius to come up with that. Well, let's put one one more factor here. But it turns huh. out well this is this is my entire work in higher arity. This is what, this was this is one of the central questions of my of my research project. Um, so I don't want to go there because this is not the this is not the venue. But uh, but I was mentioning because this formula be gives you a very easy computable out of the box notion of higher arity angle, right? Basically, if you have unit vectors in a sphere, you just three dot them, right? I call it a three dot or three dot uh, for the ternary dot product. And by the way, um, you algebraically there's no way to decompose the three dot into two dots. That's uh, generally speaking. There's no way in which you can just decompose uh, some with some general rule that given given three vectors and the values of their of their uh, dot products that you will get the value of the tri dot product. That's not possible. So it's kind of almost like this idea of mutual information uh, that you know you have pairwise mutual information that doesn't give you what the mutual information is of the three of them together. It's uh, it's that kind of notion that you have you might have the simplicial boundary but not the actual cell of the of the interaction right anyway it's a weird thing because what we did was we took some simple LLMs these ones that are you know given each vector uh, it's sorry it's word a vector uh, we were computing some cosine similarities of words like you know queen and king and they were they had some pretty small angle and then you know 
queen and often, as a word, and these two words had a higher angle, you know, some intuitive results. And I said, okay, what happens when we just define this higher order angle? Let's see, let's see what, what, what turns out. Um, so you define it, which is very easy to compute. And then we started to experimentally just uh, looking at patterns, just throwing in examples of words and see what happened, and running some randomized tests and get some statistics. And it was, you know, not fully consistent, the typical LLM fashion where you don't have like definite you know, statements that you can say, but, but it was pretty, uh, pretty common that you will put three words that are pretty much random, like something like blue, uh, whatever, often, Mm, climb, you know, three yeah, words yeah. that are it's completely random, and you would get a three a, a three dot product value, so an angle value that was larger, meaning they were sort of wider apart than if you said something like uh, fox eats rabbit, something that that can be grammatically composed as a sentence, right? Um, so it was it was very interesting because you measured fox rabbit, you measure fox eats and rabbit eats and you so this uh, cosine similarities these uh, pairwise angles and they were quite lower than so larger the angle so further apart than the one that was implied by the by the ternary one so this was a pattern that was fairly consistent it wasn't it wasn't like super you know overwhelmingly consistent that when you had grammatical dependence you had a a, a closer higher arity angle but it was definitely a pattern like you could see there was a tendency towards that uh, in, in, in this test. So anyway, so I mentioned it because um, it's, it seems that the way that these embeddings are working, and by the way, this was some of these Glove uh, algorithms. Um, the, it, it seems that it was encoding the information in some kind of way that made sense to these constructions of angles, of higher order, order angles. And we don't even know what these higher order angles really are. Like we, because we know that they don't they are not geometric in some sense because for example if you do a rotation so meaning an isometry of the pairwise dot product this uh, ternary dot products completely change they are not invariant under under that in fact they are not invariant under change of basis which is very worrying uh so okay. it's, okay. Ve it's so very it's very worrying it's... yes it's very very worrying <laughs> Uh, the, the kind of behavior. <laughs> it's very, very, very counterintuitive. Anyway, but we did find some... I mean, like one question is, do, do they encode some notion of the um, higher order angle between the three vectors? Like, um, you know, uh, so if you want to understand the, the angle... Sphere, for instance, instead of yeah. the segment of the circle. Yeah, so you... you so for, th there is such a thing as... I mean, my intuition says not really, probably. It does not. That's right. That's that's yeah. the right intuition. Yeah, because there's such a thing as a, a solid angle, right? You could, you could measure some yeah, form of yeah, so, solid I mean. angle uh -huh. between, uh, between three points by, for example, fitting a, a circle through them, uh, or something like that, right? Like you could you could do some constructions. You could fit a triangle and just, I mean, you could make some construction for three points on a sphere, and give a mm -hmm. some some notion of solid angle. Um, yeah, yeah, it's, it's the what portion of the surface area of the sphere is subtended by that that by the, um, the that triangular arc yeah the geodesic triangle right the, the spherical triangle yeah. area uh -huh. yeah so so anyway so it's it's interesting because the i mean there is a yeah that 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 actually is interesting that you mentioned that because we should probably oh there's a being emerging from <laughs> That's my cat, Yami. Like a sandworm. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Emerging, yeah. It's very cool. Um, uh, so, actually, now that you mentioned that, I might go back to that code and and just uh, code in the solid angle uh, for and and just compare those measures. That, that actually, is, that's an interesting thing to compare. I don't, I don't know why I didn't think of it at the time. Um, yeah, because I had the picture in my head. No, I could do a solid angle, but I. I'm doing this other thing. So yeah, it's definitely not solid angle. Because it's not related to solid angle in any way because uh, solid angle is obviously uh, invariant under isometries um, yeah. and under rotations. And, and this angle is completely, it's completely messed up <laughs> in some sense. It's not, it's not a well-behaved thing. We don't really understand it yet. Um, and it's, it's uncannily hard to understand. It's not even technically hard to understand. It's just 
uncanny. It's just that you don't. It's kind of this. Uh, I like to de to describe these things as xeno mathematical. They're like it's it's mathematics. It's kind of alien in some sense. Your human brain is not ready yet <laughs> to understand it. <laughs> right. Uh, I mean, it sounds very uh, sounds very. Uh, I don't know. Pretentious almost to say, oh, I'm researching something that for which the human brain is not quite ready. But there's, I don't find a better explanation when you have such a simple definition and pretty much no progress done in the last, whatever, 50 years since these things were first looked at. But yeah, anyway, that's the, that was just the detour that I wanted to mention about uh, some... Yeah, that's really interesting. So it's, it's different from the vector triple product, right? For sure. Oh yeah, that's, that's the... Yeah. Yeah, vector triple product is probably the closest to the solid angle. Might actually be equivalent. And we did compare it to that. Ah, that might be why I was thinking of it. Yeah, I think, I think, because we were not working on a sphere, we were actually not. But I mean, is that true? No, that's not true. No, the solid the angle. Triple product is that product of the vector with. The cross product of two other vectors yes. in three dimensions. It's it's basically the volume of the of the par parallelepiped that is Rolling generated. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's it's, but that's not the same as the solid angle because this. Uh, well, um, there is some relation. That's a weird relation. It's some weird relation between the solid angle and the. Because for small solid angles, it seems to be quite directly related, but for larger ones, clearly not. Because you could have a maximum circle and you have three points in a maximum circle. So they are actually coplanar. So they have zero triple product, um, mm -hmm. but they have maximum solid angle in some sense. Right? Yeah. So anyway, no, thanks, thanks for that comment. Cause I, I'm gonna, gonna go back and compare to the solid angle uh, so I wonder now I became extremely curious about this. This is bad for our lives in this general, general interest, but I guess I became extremely curious if you give me three vectors, um, in general, I guess, do they have to be in 3d? If you give me three vectors, um, it could, it could be in two dimensions too. No, for sure. Yes. But in two dimensions, the. The solid angle is just the the normal angle, right? So I guess it does have uh, to be. Yeah, I mean, in two dimensions, the angle, the dot product gives you the angle. Yeah. For two vectors. For two vectors. Yeah, yeah I think I think it's it, it scales the with the the arity scales with the dimensionality. I think. So I think if you are in two dimensions, you have a binary. Angle is binary. If you are in three dimensions, angle is ternary. Um, because it, it essentially, it's always, you're, if you're going to restrict to a sphere, you're always going to have, um, you're always going to have, you need to specify a greater, uh, you need to specify a region on the sphere that is basically a geodesic polygon, right? And the sphere is n, n minus one dimensional. And that's the number of points that you need to specify a polygon, right? In n minus one dimension, you need yeah. n points, mm -hmm. right? So, at least in three dimensions, it makes sense. I'm, I'm not just in three dimensions. I'm just curious right now. If you give me three vectors, you normal, you normalize them. So, or you give me three points in the sphere. Mm -hmm. What is the relation between the solid angle that they form with this definition of the the the, 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 the geodesic triangle, the area enclosed by the geodesic triangle? with the usual um, uh, vector vector calculus of 3d like uh, how, how do you this feels like a yeah. vector yeah so system. given given three vectors in any space even if they're like um in a bigger dimensional yeah. space then those three vectors will span a three-dimensional sub subspace. subspace correct you can look there and if you normalize them then there'll be three points on that sphere that's in the right space which they span and then um and then you're looking at, you know, in between any two points, there's a unique geodesic segment that that connects them. So you're looking at these 
three geodesic arcs on a, a unit sphere in three dimensions for three vectors. That's right. And um, if they're in general position, that is not coplanar. That is, they span a three dimensional subspace instead of a two dimensional subspace. Then they'll have a, a, a solid angle between the three of them. You'll have a parallel hyphen yeah. uh, that they create. Yeah. And you can measure the volume of that using the triple product. Um, That's very interesting. Yeah, I wonder how much, um, if if there's anything to be said about uh, geometric algebra in this. this oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I'm sure that, yeah, de definitely. Definitely. I mean, if I were flu more fluent in uh, geometric algebra, maybe I would have a quicker, because right now, this is actually exactly what geometric algebra is good for. <laughs> now that I think about mm -hmm. it, it's exactly this question of like, oh, um, just, but this also feels like a typical vector analysis question. Because, but at the same time, it's very geometric. So it feels like, I feel like I can actually, I mean, I know how to write down a formula to compute this area. Like, I just know. Like you, you just do some simple surface area integral. It's easy to easy to to put like to write up explicitly. Yeah, it's easier to go measure. Uh -huh. Yeah, but I'm sure that you know that would be like a hack. You know, like oh, say this vector, take the parametrization of this surface this way. Like it's it it would feel very hacky. And in some sense, you should be able to because any in any metric space, and this is relevant to the. To the topic. I mean, we are not completely off the mark here discussing discussing this to this topic because a big point of discussion last time in private in the concept collider and during the this data re reduction uh, dimensionality reduction kind of phase has been the notion of whether your space should have a metric in the first place or not, and whether you assume a notion of distance and and, and whatnot. So if you do have a notion of distance, um, sorry, a notion of metric specifically, which is stronger than distance, I'd say, uh, because it also gives you angles and all that stuff. Um, you you automatically have this notion of solid angle, right? Because exactly because of what you described. You can always, given three vectors, you go down to the subspace they generate. Um, if the subspace is two-dimensional, then solid angle is zero, and then you might have line angle uh, between pairs, as usual. Uh, but... But if the if they span a three-dimensional subspace, then that subspace, yeah, the unit. What is that? Um, yeah, I mean the unit ball. The unit ball is the unit ball, right? In that, in that so the intersection of the unit ball with that subspace, right, mm -hmm. is a three-dimensional, yeah, three-dimensional. Yeah, you kind of have a three-dimensional, like, sphere out of whatever yeah. dimension you're sitting inside of. Yeah, exactly, because uh, you have a constraint, you say radius equals one, and uh, so norm equals one, and then you have another constraint, which is you belong to this space. So if you're if it's true that you belong to this space, which is, means that you're three D, but your norm is one, then you're in a sphere. So yeah. So it's definitely a, a traditional three dimensional sphere. Okay, fine. And so now the interesting thing is, um, so that's always well defined, and therefore these three vectors lie on three points of a sphere, and therefore have a well defined notion of solid angle among them. So indeed, any space, any metric space has a notion of solid angle. Sorry, I was just uh, sort of packaging that statement in my mind. So I, I know that that's yeah, yeah. So, right. Okay, interesting. Um, or Euclidean spaces, yeah. I can't imagine what... Oh, what, yeah, yeah. Um, sorry, yes, yes, yes. Raw yes. spaces would look like, although they do have, you know, their own notion of, of, of unit spheres in there. Yes. You, know, you can always come to a point and, and measure you know, collect, collect points that are within a, you know, in a, in a ball. Yeah. Um, you just have that the surface area of the sphere grows lar more larger than, um, than, uh, Alex. than, than the Euclidean case. Yeah. Yeah. Alex, you appeared in the perfect time.
to rescue the conversation really? from just the running away completely into <laughs> into doing some uh, vector geometry <laughs> just for the hell of it. Um, <laughs> Okay, sorry, because I, I, I completely forgot. Um, yeah, yeah, it's unusual time. I, I, a new time, it's a new time. Yeah, yeah in fact, I, it was, uh, it's funny because I've been remembering it for the last two previous days, uh, which it was delayed and precisely what it was. <laughs> but anyways, no, no worries. Uh, no worries. So, no, it's, I think it's a good, good transition point. I mean, you came in in a perfect timing because uh, we, um, we have been, we were mentioning this, this notion of um, how in in data in data representation you might have the topic that you're familiar with that there might be a space where you represent your points whether there's a metric there or not this kind of question and so I mentioned um, so Dugan was uh, particular particularly curious about how to represent uh, or how to um, think of these very highly dimensional spaces for LLMs and things like that and so I mentioned that. Uh, I did some experiments uh, with definitions of higher generalizations of angle between between this uh, between vectors of the embeddings and so on, um, and so anyway, so we got into a conversation of whether, I mean, and in fact you can always define solid angle, which is this idea of if you are for three points instead of two, so two you have the arc on a sphere or circle rather, and then for three points you have the the geodesic triangle on a sphere. Right, so the area of that triangle, as compared to the whole of the sphere, the four pi solid uh, radians or whatever, uh, you um, you you can define as the sort of a solid angle between three vectors. Anyway, so we just had a purely geometric conversation for the last ten minutes or so, um, but it's good that you just joined because um, I feel like it's good to try to think, in my opinion. In this, uh, in this um, topics of data representation, um, okay, fine. Imagine we have that. What do we do with it? Like, imagine that we we had some something, you know, a solid angle or whatever. I mean, solid angle supposedly is generalized for arbitrariety, meaning you can define among n vectors some kind of n angle uh, between them. Uh, by doing this sort of game of geodesic polygons on n dimension n minus one dimensional sphere. But anyway, uh, the point is, um, I think it would be very very interesting for you to bring bring back the questions and the kind of uh, takeaways that you had because I mentioned at the beginning of the live stream that uh, this whole topic began with your questions and so on and um, and so yeah, I think if you tell us where remind the audience and for the record that what you were interested in. I think uh, the conversation is ready to sort of move on. Unless, uh, by the way, unless Dugan or Amol had some follow-up or some question that they wanted to mention before we basically just transition into a new phase of the conversation. Anything to say? Yeah, yeah. in fact, in fact uh, if, if Amol has uh, anything else, because uh, before I opened the, uh, the notes I had uh, made, so that's a good me. Yeah. To, to open the notes. Yeah. I'm all Dugan. Any uh, remarks, comments? Yeah, not um, really, but yeah, I, I find it interesting the concept of solid angles. So I was just trying to wrap my heads around it. <laughs> I have, I have uh, homework for tonight. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, like, uh, I was uh, thinking it uh, in a practical context, like, we, we just had this for solar eclipse, right? So, and and it happens, uh, uh, we observe it as such uh, from the viewpoint of Earth because the moon and the sun, they both obtain the exact same solid angle on Earth as observed from Earth. So, so the angular displacement of those objects with respect to Earth is, is the solid angular displacement uh, is, is the same. So. Yeah, so that's interesting. Okay, so I'm covering it up in Mathematica yeah. to play with it myself, although I, I don't expect to get anywhere in the next 10 minutes. Okay. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Is there so, a, anyways, first of all, go, go on, go on, yeah. go on, go on. Yeah, yeah. The floor is yours. So first of all, what I, what I was um, initially um, 
interested in was uh, what I the first thing that I mentioned was this um, this uh, potential usefulness for the concept of uh, or the dichotomy of, dichotomy of um, no sorry the concept of vectors but in the sense of uh, vectors versus scalars. Mm -hmm. Um, I was partially interested in, in, on it because of uh, of this dichotomy that happens in physics, which is basically um, the uh, the um, how to say it, where is it? Yeah, basically the fermions and bosons based on different kinds of formulations of fields, uh, spinorial, sp spinorial and vectorial fields, basically. Yeah, but uh, without entering into that. I was generally uh, interested in this kind of dichotomy between scalar and, and vector reality, and in general also the the directionality as a whole in, as a mathematical concept in relation both to scalars and to the module because um, that's if you have a, a direction and a module you have a vector and, and Carlos uh, explained that that the most um, basic thing is the is the uh, is the the vectoriality uh, of the vectoriality is the is this directionality? We were talking about the um, the ability to define um, yeah uh, about uh, affine spaces and the ability to define uh, a directionality with it without uh, the concept of distance. Was it was it? Uh, I mean, you saying it right? Yeah. 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 So um, well, in an affine space, don't you have a notion of um, the subtraction of two vectors? Yes. Oh, would you? Yeah. Ah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can take the uh, normal of that. Yeah. So, so yeah. I think I think Alex is basically recapping that. Well, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So, yeah. Exactly. So, so that was oh. one example. Yeah. So, um, I've been interested in in, in that kind of dichotomy because I think that it may um relate to many other things. Uh, and in fact, for example, in my um. In the, previous, in the previous discussion, I, I mentioned the uh, um, about dimensionality production and all the all this stuff. I mentioned the idea of perhaps two kinds of uh, of information related to uh, um, to the and to a trade of a statistical trade off even in not only in um, between machine learning and classical inference, statistical inference, but even inside machine in types of machine learning. From for example, you have um, Usually you have um, higher predictive power, but less interpretability. And this kind of thing, um, for example, this, this last thing uh, depends on the on assuming a, a very specific um, uh, distribution of your data um, or a very specific substructure of your data um, or just manipulating the data uh, for it to, uh, to, to get to, um, sorry, let me let me explain. So, we were talking about this manifold versus uh, versus met, uh, modal space or background uh, metric. So uh, my idea is that when you assume a very very specific uh, module of a, or space or metric, um, you are assuming uh, uh, the uh, the subjacent distribution in a very strict way. And you try to adapt your your the manifold that you that you will create uh, try to to fit to that as you say. Uh, so when you assume the first thing, uh, your manifold is going to adapt uh, indep very dependently on on the data and this uh, this assumption. This kind of thing, I I think, uh, is very similar to what has usually happened when you try to assume like a very um, a very flat um, reality in biology, and you try to like without assumptions, as to say, and you try, but you try to fit very, very, very well the data that you have. But the thing is that you are not fitting it like to um, uh, not only with your data. You are always having an assumption, and that assumption in this case it is flat metric, for example, uh, Euclidean. I mean, for example, and stuff. This can lead to a very high predictive power, but the thing is that you are not assuming that your metric is going to is may it may have a very different or more complex substructure, uh, which is usually the case in biological systems. 
Uh, so the thing is that perhaps if we try to um, to improve the interpretability of your of your models, and then the biological process, uh, like give importance to the biological plausibility of your of your model, then you have maybe to to uh, to consider that this is not the that or that another met metric is not the proper one. That's the general uh, approach that I that I think that, the, that is uh, the general discussion that is behind the, the curtain, as to say. And this, I really think that it has a lot of a lot to do with um, this uh, how we how important we consider uh, vector reality and stuff. But I don't have a very clear idea on that yet, especially because I don't have a very strong mathematical background. Mm -hmm. uh, physics and mathematics is a, a more like a hobby to me. But I really think that it may have to do something like in the very long term at least with uh, how, for example, general relativity found out that we can uh, very precisely and very interestingly uh, modify the kind of um, background uh, uh, space time, for example, uh, the background metric that we, that we, ha that we have. Uh, to depending on the things that we, uh, the structure or the um, or matter and energy that we are trying to study, I really think that these are very general um, tenets in the history of, of mathematics and science. And in the same way, we assume that uh, Euclidean space was the, was the only one. Now we happen to do the same inside um, several kind of machine learning techniques, but it shouldn't be the case, maybe. And you mentioned transformers, assuming an, an sphere and stuff. So. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. So, Alex, why, why I don't know, Dungan, do you want to follow up? Yeah, so, so uh, what are you positing that, like, okay, so the, in an LLM that you have words being embedded in a vector space, a high dimensional vector space, and, um, and then, you know, you can normalize that to the sphere, so you're just worrying about not the uh, magnitude of each vector, but uh, the directionality and, and how two vectors will either be similar in their, um, and their dot product or or uh, orthogonal with the zero dot product between them, uh, so you can have you know agreeance or or disagreement disagreement of, among the, these vectors in their um, in their meaning, what their meaning is. Uh, so you can measure meaning using normalized vectors in a Euclidean space, or but then again, okay. So yeah, the, the, the thing is that it might it might be a good thing to look at what would uh, if we embedded these um, words as uh, vertices points in a in a more abstract manifold which on the, on the one hand if we normalize them to the sphere then we're already working on this manifold uh, a spherical manifold yeah so my my intuition there is i mean around this this topic is that um if you for example if you assume a, a Euclidean space me metric uh, but uh, the uh, the subjacent metric is more is naturally more complex or, le or yeah a kind of non euclidean non -inclin and stuff. Um, that complexity or that amount of information is going to make your manifold. I mean, there's an additional. So what I'm saying is there's an additional amount of complexity and information that if you assume a Euclidean metric, but in fact, there's not an Euclidean metric. That amount of information and complexity is going to go somewhere else, specifically to the other complexity of your manifold. So the thing is that to me, um, of course, this that kind of, that complexity and information is going to is not going to go away. Um, so if you and maybe the thing is that if you don't assume maybe a little bit more complexity in your metric in your in the yeah the, in the um, in your metric space. Uh, you are going to get a, a, a much more complexity uh, and intricacy in your manifold. So, uh, of course, the thing is that uh, sometimes something is more efficient and sometimes something, some other cho cho uh, choices isn't, isn't. My concept of efficiency is precisely this. So, uh, sometimes if you add a lot more complexity to your metric space, uh, you won't get a much um, less uh, complex manifold, but sometimes you will. You will. So that defines uh, when it's more and more useful to to consider just a Euclidean space or 
a little bit more. That's my intuition now. Hmm. So I was wondering, Alex, if you had, because, I mean, we are we are in this even in this business of of wondering about these topics almost because you had questions, like if you had some concrete question that you can maybe formulate so we can all react to it because i think yeah, it's yeah, very yeah. good to to afterwards like just go on and see how we all think but i, I think we because those are usually pre your questions are usually good <laughs> so let me just put it that way briefly Thanks. like your questions are, are normally very good <laughs> so <laughs> thank one you more so of much. those <laughs> so so a more concrete question would be like something, yeah, so something something need, need, yeah, yeah. need not need not be very directly related to anything specifically that we were been, been talking about, but generally in this topic, something that because I have questions of my of mine, but I I have I am totally biased by knowing the stuff that I know. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. But but so it would be great to hear if you if you want to take some time, maybe some of you can pose a question and just throw it, and then we can all yeah, try to yeah, yeah. give our. Our, our thoughts on it. Because uh, okay, so yeah. Mm, okay, so, so one, one question, question could be like, like I really think that that, that um, in uh, in uh, in an abstract field, you could assume like two very important things. First of all, the the directionality or the vectoriality, as to say, and the density of for example uh, if it's a force field for example um i really think that there's i don't know if there's uh if it it is considered that there's um that these two components are inherently like orthogonal like in a in, it makes sense mathematically to to put them that way um i really think that they are very separate in some sense ah okay yeah sorry do formulate your question is that is that yeah, that, that's that's my question. Okay, like, okay. Are they, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. Okay, so just to reformulate the question to make sure I understand correctly, um, you're yeah. saying something like, you know, in typical field theory, you'll have a pretty different treatment, especially when you learn about it, of something like a density distribution of, say, like a cloud of dust, you know, planetary cloud or, you know, temperature in a room, things like that. Scalar fields, yeah. some physicists might call it. And something like a, like a velocity field of maybe the same planetary cloud or whatever or the you know the air in a yeah. room or something, um, and so that would basically one would be assigning to each point a number because it's basically the density around that point, and uh, the other would be assigning a direction or a vector to that point, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, something that I maybe didn't emphasize enough when we first discussed this was that these two are. I mean, they are very fundamental in the sense that they are indeed primitive in, in the following sense, in the sense that in geometry, you normally think of geometry is made of two things, essentially. Uh, and this is extremely reductive, but I'll try to be cartoonish uh, just for the sake of, of argument. There's two things in geometry, differential geometry, I'd say. There's curves and there's functions. And basically everything is built on top of these two options. I mean, Curves and functions, assuming that you have something to call geometry, the space or something, you know, in, in your in your base, yeah, something where you exist. But once you have that, you have curves and you have functions, and basically everything is built out of these two constructions. And so, functions are almost like landscapes, and curves are like journeys through that landscape, right? It's that's kind of like the the idea, and and so, what emerges from a landscape or features or something like that is this idea of a function, a scalar function, something that just assigns values at every point, technically need not be a scalar because you could assign all the characteristics that are richer than scalars. And that's what I kind of wanted to mention later. But primitively, it's 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 the simplest thing is scalar. And then the other thing is a curve where it's more like how you're traversing you, th that, that space. So in a very traditional way in which calculus, like calculus in the proper sense of like derivatives, integrals and that stuff, um, is developed, normally you only define those and then everything else is built up. Everything is sort of like composed of those and, and goes up. However, 
you can actually um, so for, by the way curves give you vectors just with this notion of the tangent vector right like the tangent velocity right like an infinitesimal curve is kind of a direction um, so and so that's why you could think that this you know scalar field and velocity field or vector field is kind of the foundation of everything it kind of is in a technical sense but in more more conceptually there isn't such a kind of bipartite two sets of two kinds of things it's much it's more richer in the following sense so you can generalize curves by considering what it's known as sap manifolds just more generally so a curve is a very special kind of sap manifold right it's some kind of one dimensional trace on your space but you can then generalize and take for example tubes or sort of blobs deformed spheres you know tori all, all kinds of i mean this becomes much com more complicated and richer um and and further you can take foliations of such things so you can take kind of like curves of surfaces and and so on you can go higher dimensional and you know these things generalize curves generalize very naturally and the same way that you have, the curves have tangent vectors and they are kind of velocities your surfaces will have tangent planes and those planes will give you some structures and you know there's a lot of uh, the technical side of differential geometry that deals exactly with those kinds of things and then similarly on the function side instead of assigning to each point a characteristic that is only uh, given by a number so something like temperature or something like that you could be assigning to every point a characteristic that is other than a number as and so you, you have this example of a vector field but you could have something like uh, the you know the fanciest thing that most people study in you know, engineering and things like that, which is the, a stress tensor, and that's something that a lot of people encounter. So what is a stress tensor? So a stress tensor, it's, it's a tensor, as the name suggests. It's not. It's, it's given by by a matrix. Um, and why is it given by a matrix? Because normally it's it's kind of how you model the elasticity of a of a medium, right? So okay, you say elasticity. Okay, is elasticity uh, a scalar? Is it, or is elasticity a vector? Think of elasticity as like the property of something being elastic, right? Some rubber band or something. When you think about it, in order for the elasticity to show up, you need to poke it somehow, right? Like you need to push in some direction and then the, the elastic medium will sort of try to push back in that direction, right? So that if you think about it, the pushback is a force. So maybe you want to represent it with a vector, but you push in is also kind of a force or has a direction, right? So that's why you need a, 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 an object that inputs a direction and outputs a direction, right? So a tensor, uh, which is you know, this two index object, is a matrix or can be understood as a matrix in this context for simplicity, which is understood as something that takes a vector and gives you a vector, right? So the stress tensor is a very typical case uh, of, uh, of, uh, of a field that is not a vector field, that is not a scalar field, but is nonetheless capturing something that is very intuitive, which is something like the fact that a material is elastic, but mostly elastic in non-homogeneous ways or, or non, um, as you would say, isotropic ways, more technical terms, meaning that you might push in one direction and actually get shared forces that push in different directions and whatnot. But the point is that conceptually speaking, elasticity is a property that is that kind of imagine that your object is made of different like mixed materials and, you know, it's harder in one bed and softer in another and whatnot. So you would have a function of how the object reacts to you poking it. But the poking is not just measured by how much pressure you're applying. It actually depends on what direction you're poking in the object in. And so that's a direction. And what you get back with it, out of it is a reaction force, which is, an, again, a vector. So conceptually, you're doing vector goes to vector. So the object that lives at every point in that object is a vector goes to vector function. Right. So that's why they call it a tensor, because there's generally tensors, the, the multilinear maps that map vectors to vectors. So. So is it like you go to every point in this this uh, volume of material and, yeah. and try to see how how much the um, yeah. the force is acting on the on the static object or trying to shear it? Yeah. That, so you have like some sort of linear operator. Yeah. Pushing at that at that spot. Yeah. And every spot is a different shearing force. Yeah. In general, yeah. yeah. So so it's just a, it's just an intuitive example. That you don't you don't have to say oh there's some technicality some conceptual theoretical construction that I need to come up to say there's something more than vectors and scalars but something as simple as a soft body that is just made of different like bits and parts and it's not like not homogeneous even even that case gives you a very intuitive understanding that you would need if you still are thinking in Newtonian terms of like forces like vectors and velocities and things like that you would need something that 
conceptually at every point assigns a mapping from a vector which is the input force to a vector which is the output output force and that's at every point a tensor and that's why it's called the the stress tensor field or whatever and so yeah anyway yeah just just as a comment that there's there's more to it in that sense but it is true that fundamentally the calculus is built in that in that way you first define functions and curves or vectors and then kind of build out of that um and indeed tensors are maps from vectors to vectors not from esoteric things into esoteric things so you do have to you do you do need a notion of vector to begin with in the, in the first place so so this doesn't this doesn't invalidate any of the questions that conceptual that, that we have been discussing and but it's just a, a kind of a a way to give a, a sort of a, a context where these uh, so-called multilinear objects this uh, i like to pre i prefer to call them multilinear objects instead of tensors because tensors are very contested you know all, all of the machine learning people yeah. call tensor to by the way anecdote i was i was in a seminar two days ago um uh, it was a actually a tensor what's it called tensor rank and tensor analysis uh, working seminar that just started this week uh, among uh, amsterdam and a few european uh, universities and uh, I was there, and the first definition, they said, oh, there's, there's have an introductory uh, seminar on tensors and whatnot. The first definition of tensor they gave, so, okay, let's do the, let's do the uh, primary school definition of tensor. They just said, a tensor is an array of numbers, right? Like, it could be a vector, it could be a matrix, it could be, like, a cube of numbers. It could be, okay, that's simple enough, and, you know, everyone understands, imagines, you know, okay, fine. And then the next slide, they said, okay, now let's, let, let's give the technical definition of tensor. Um, and so they say a tensor is a multilinear map from a collection of vector spaces into, into the scalars. Um, and so it was very funny because, you know, I said, okay, and then and they say, and of course, once you choose a basis in your vector space, you can make a tensor in this sense into a tensor in this other sense. And so, you know, I raised my hand and said, um, hey, but wouldn't you need to care about what happens when you change your basis to another basis or, so that your, you know, your array completely, completely changes your matrix is unrecognizable. You know, you can't really, if you don't know what transformation you did, there's no way that you can guess, you know. Um, and so, and you know, the guy was like, but I don't think the same. So anyway, the anecdote is even in this seminar, people were defining tensors as arrays and tensors of multilinear mappings almost as indistinguishable, where in reality, an array is quite literally just a table of numbers. Like, has no more structure than just a table of numbers and the tensor carries like it's almost like thinking the difference of thinking about like uh like an array of numbers it's 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 quite literally like you know you go to your uh, uh to your supermarket and you see a whatever like a schedule when they open they close like this is the kind of information that they're giving you right because it's just a table of values and there's nothing else and a tensor is more like you know that's a way in which you're mapping infinite infinite uh, elements in sets that are infinitary into other infinitary sets i say infinitary because vector spaces are sort of like they have they might have finite dimensions but you still have infinitely many elements um and and they do so with these very particular multilinear properties and so on and, and it's like it's a much more sort of sophisticated machine that, that is accounting for a lot of properties and is doing a lot of heavy lifting and satisfies a lot of nice mathematical conditions and the other is just literally like a chart of numbers. So, so you know, it was it was funny because, um, yeah, even in that seminar, uh, I you know, the speaker was like, ah, oh, maybe, and then some other people, yeah, yeah, yeah. said, so, yeah, actually, that's true. We have to be careful. But here we're interested in very concrete questions, blah blah blah. But anyway, just as an anecdote, that tensor is a pretty sleep is a pretty uh, slippery term that people like throw out a lot. And uh, I've said a few times in the past. I'll say it again here. Tensor should be reserved for a multilinear object. That, that's where a tensor is. I mean, you, that's traditionally what... And if you have an array of numbers, then call it an array. <laughs> like, I would even concede matrix. If you want to call it just matrix, generalized matrix, you know, and just call it, call it that, that's fine. But don't call it tensor when you don't have any idea how, how it's going to transform when you change your basis because you don't even, know, you don't even have a basis to begin with, right? It's like... Um, so yeah, anyway. <laughs> right, once you choose a basis, then you could know how the a particular tensor acts on that basis, and you could say, okay, well, for this basis element, I get this yeah. scalar quantity. Yeah. And and if you have a finite number of bases, then you can start listing out how it acts on this thing, and you get you can start filling out those coefficients. Exactly. But yeah, that's, that's 
predicated upon the notion that you have a, a tensorial object defined algebraically between vector spaces that are defined over a particular, um, you know, scalar field. Yeah. Uh, and you have to be, you know, I remember going through all of that in grad school and it was, yes. it was quite uh, a lot of uh, uh, bookkeeping. Bookkeeping. Yeah, it's just bookkeeping. It's not, it's not, it's not very sophisticated, but, you know, it, it's, it's fascinating to me that people who uh, do research on tensor rank, on tensor algorithms and things like that, it, it's kind of fascinating to see them not like not everyone because there were people who, who absolutely agreed with me and that they were saying of course like there's there's really no question no, no, no question there but there was a good chunk of the of the people in that seminar that didn't really get the question they said what do you mean you know how how is how is an array not just the answer it's like okay so the, you know anyway it's just uh, funny to me that, that these people don't um but anyway uh that's that's a tangential thing so so yeah, uh, I think yeah, yeah it's, it's a difficult thing to try to um, dial back and try to think of a, a vector space and sort of an algebraic uh, geometric algebra sort of way where where the yeah. the basis isn't chosen for you. You yes. just start putting out vectors and seeing how they relate. Yeah, uh, and going back to the question um, to Alex's question and, and and going and circling back to something that might be more useful for people interested on the scientific side, data application kind of side, like Alex was asking. Um, I don't. I don't say these things to be pedantic. I, people who know me know that I am. I mean, I like to be precise, but I don't particularly have a patient to be pedantic and just like get caught up in, in unnecessary details. If I stress this out, it's because I think it's actually very relevant. Because if you if you think of a matrix um, or a vector, you know, like a array of numbers and so on, if you think of those things as vectors in an abstract sense, and you happen to be, I don't know, a physicist that always dealt with those instead of uh, defining the abstract spaces and things like that, um, then you need to be ready to realize that when all the constructions that are vectorial, they are not actually exploiting the fact that your elements, meaning the vectors, are made of numbers, right? Like they, they are, most of the constructions don't exploit that because, you know, if you have vectors, they're made of numbers, then suddenly you have many ways to multiply them together, right? Like you can say, oh, this component by this component, then do this, that, that. And then you have two vectors, I create this third vector that's just related to them. And I define it by, you know, take first component of one, multiply by the third component of other, add the, the third one to the fourth. Like, you know, you could make this, this construction. All oh, that's after you've chosen the uh, exactly. orthogonal basis to describe your, your vectors. Exactly. You could do all those constructions. And so, you know, when you ask someone, why don't we use those constructions? Why don't we... Like, why aren't they part of analysis? Why, why are they not used in algorithms and so on? Like, for example, the, the Hadamard product, right, of vectors, which Hadamard product means that you put two vectors in parallel with their components. I mean, vectors as in arrays of numbers, right? And you put them in parallel and you multiply the components one by one. So first component times second component, second component times second component, so on, right? And so that gives you a new vector of the same size. And obviously it's, uh, you know, as a component vector, meaning an array of numbers is in the same space, it's just the same. But if you change if you change spaces, you would you would find that the new vector that you define this way has uh, has a different expression in in in, two, in in this under the same transformation. So basically, it's uh, it's not a basis independent construction. So if you do that in right. one basis, you get one vector. You do that in another basis, you get another vector. Which means that the construction knows about what basis you chose. Therefore, it knows. Uh, the commitments and biases that you already have, and it's not a proper operation in the vector space. So nobody uses that operation. I mean, in computer science they do obviously, but in physics and applications and data analysis, almost no one uses those operations because they seem to be non-useful or somehow mysteriously. But if you never learn the theory that there's a vector space in the background with these very minimalistic axioms, uh, which capture, by the way, this is where I'm going with the answer, which capture this idea of directionality or is your data, does it make sense in your data to say, I am two times in the same direction of this data object or I'm minus one times in the direction of this data object, right? Where you have this sort of like, um, Coplanar or collinear co kind of relations between between objects of your data, right? Which is a strong assumption, but many times a, a useful one. Um, that's that's what people. I mean, that's what you can use out of a vector space. But if you're not, you never never learn this, 
um, you just you're just mystified and you might think, oh, why are people so sheepish to just always keep using the same dot product, you know, uh, addition of vectors and and, and cross cross conspiracy. Yeah, yeah it's I mean, conspiracy. It, it, it's like, in a sense, it's, it's more physical. You can take without defining like how you want to orient the space that you're in. You can take two rulers and you can put them at like an angle next to each other. You can measure. Okay, well, this ruler like projects onto this ruler to have this measurement no. in that in that uh, notion of length along that direction. And you don't have, you can compute the outcome of a dot product without um, necessarily saying, okay, well, I'm going to set up my uh, X, Y, and Z vectors as orthogonal vectors aligned with like the wall back there, you know, like this coordinate frame. And then um, once I have that, then I can measure where these rulers are relative to that. And then I have a system of three numbers that I take products of, then I add them up, then I take the cosine, and then I get the angle back. You can measure the angle directly in space with physical objects. And um, that's why coordinate independent measurements are ubiquitous in physics, is because that's what physicists are doing in space. And then, uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Hello. No, I was going to, I'm just going to jump to a different thought. Like you had a thought, uh, yeah, just brief, brief um, commentary on uh, epistemological commentary on what Carlos, the last thing that Carlos said. Uh, I don't think that it's uh, de Guido because it, I really think that that's that's what mathematics is is about. I mean, if you go to Cantor and tell him, oh, your your entire life's work is just uh, uh, talking about bags with uh, with balls in them. I mean. Mm, that's yeah, like I said. It's just that you know. I mean, mm, it's something more, more a little bit more, more complex than that. I, you can you can always, and I think that also always uh, happens in applied in applied mathematics, mathematics in physics and stuff. This whole fight between mathematicians and, phys and physicians, like this is it's like uh, physics um, mathematical uh, mathematicians saying like what what the hell are you doing with my with my tool. Um, the complexity of mathematics is because of, is there uh, precisely to to prepare very specific tools for, for very specific purposes and sometimes simplifying them at the semantic level can seem useful but in, in fact it's not so it's it's important to, to remember remember people this um, yeah absolutely Edwin, would you uh, um, going to follow up with yeah you? so i was just gonna like wax on Marx poetic on the notion of you know extending okay you can have like a, a manifold and then you can have or, or like a space and you can have a field on that space like a scalar field or a vector field or um i like to think about um line bundles fiber bundles or or like at every point of space you have like a certain um like if you have a non-zero two-dimensional vector field then you can normalize that and you can just uh, look at like um every point is associated with a point on a circle instead of like a scalar value. So you can have like a, a and then points on a circle can be, can be represented with like um, a color on a color wheel, you know, of, of you know, um, a certain um, brightness and, and, and um, what's the other one? Hue, saturation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's like the saturation, the brightness are of the one. And you just rotate the hue, uh, so you have um, uh, a, a sort of field where you don't allow zero to happen. Mm -hmm. Just yeah. kind of have like this this angle measurement. That's right. That's that's what came to mind. I, I didn't want to invoke the the term fiber bundle, but uh, so I'm not guilty of having done it. So now, I, but now I can write on it. Um, yeah. This is this is yeah. These constructions are extremely extremely ubiquitous in modern physics and they they're kind of the foundation of most of most of modern mathematics so quantum mechanics like string theory uh, and stuff yeah everything like well, yes because you have these coiled up dimensions like I, okay so like the circle bundle is like uh like yeah. you have if you have like a two-dimensional sheet or manifold and then you have like these circles attached that's like yeah. kind of like the velcro yeah so i mean and, Vector bundles. A, a section out of that would be a choice of. Yeah. Uh, like is, a that, little... is that like 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 
like maybe like a like a field of spins or something like that. like the the spin from electrons or, or stuff like like it's the every that they, every point in that space is is inherently a is that I just yeah 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 so it's, yeah, yeah. It's, it's it's related like if the spin it's, vector is a point on a on a uh, pointing in a direction on a sphere then like it's related have, it's related out. yes it's 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 totally related uh, in fact uh, these kinds of um, vector bundle, this kind of fiber bundles, these circle bundles and things like that are how you mathematically rigorously define spin in, in, in this uh, this idea that because um, uh, I mean spin spin was I would say still is a little bit uh, dodgy to understand for a lot of people. I mean, famously uh, Michael yeah, Edgar, uh, yeah, the, the classical thing of it's not a ball rotating; it's just an inherent yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. But so 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 yeah. But even mathematically. Like, I mean, physically, as you say, so, I mean, the, the theory of spin and the spinner representation, spinorial math, this is very well understood in some sense. Like, there's a lot of literature. So this is not like what I was mentioning earlier, this uh, ternary dot product that is much less un understood. This, this is proper, well charted. But I will tell the anecdote that, um, you know, Michael Atilla is uh, this, this mathematician that basically pioneered um, the, all the mathematics, uh, all this uh, fiber bundle mathematics all this idea that you have your space and you have like different things that you assign to a point and those things need not be numbers or need not be vectors but they might be a bit more general objects like, like we were saying um and so he developed uh, a pioneering theory about transformations of those spaces and how you can move around between different objects in different points and things like that so uh when he was must have been like 85 or 86 already uh when i met him in, in edinburgh uh, he gave a talk about fundamental physics and how the open, open problems that he was trying to solve and whatnot. It was very energetic, very, uh, I mean, uh, this guy was amazing to watch. I mean, super inspiring, super, uh, like a force of nature. Like everyone described him as a force of nature. It's just incredible. Um, and then it was funny because when I got to him, I, I, got, I got to work with him much more closely and I was meeting him every week and so on. Um, I remember that he said, you know, he gave a talk about, about spinners. This is kind of the, grandfather of spinners almost in, uh, in the in the mathematical community and you know he gives a talk where he mentions spinners and some kind of new ideas he had and comes to me and says carlos i think i'm beginning to understand spinners now <laughs> it's like i was like okay uh this is the career goals get to 87 be be completely worldwide known for for this kind of mathematics and then come out of a talk for undergrads and say i think i'm beginning to understand spinners so, but yeah, um, so it, it's a, it's a tricky thing because it requires this, uh, higher dimensional constructions that, that don't naturally project. So, so it, it, it's a double cover. So, so these are three dimensional manifolds, like the spin is, is represented usually by a three dimensional manifold and, uh, an important bundle related to this is the, what's called the hop fibra vibration, which is, a uh, which lives on, uh, on which it forms a three-dimensional sphere. So a three-dimensional sphere is not a it's not a ball, right? It's a it it means that you are on a you're actually if you wanted to see it as a ball, you have to go to four dimensions and then you are a ball in three dimensions, right? That's a three-dimensional sphere. So a three-dimensional sphere that is vibrated by two-dimensional um, by two-dimensional uh, spheres. Right? Well, the, the, yeah. Yeah. So it's, so three sphere fibers in the circles. And the base sphere yep. that the quotient space is equivalent to is the two two sphere. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So so you have so the the space itself where you have to imagine your spin is living is a manifold of which you only have familiarity by being embedded in. Like you you could we could very well be living on a three sphere, but we might not know it because everything looks flat around us. Um, it's kind of like the with the actual two D sphere of the, of the Earth. Like if it's big enough, you would not you would not notice. But geometrically, you might be living in a in a three sphere. But the problem is you have no intuition what a three sphere looks like because you don't live in four dimensions. You can just like pop out to the fourth dimension, look at, look down. Oh yeah, that's what it looks like, and then come back. Um, so so it's it's hard to to imagine. It's it's not intuitive, and and I mean, spin was invented pretty much as a to explain what was being observed in quantum mechanics. And it so happens that the field theories that you define over these things were, are the things that match naturally the fermionic behavior and so on. It, it happens to match like this particular kind of particles. Um, 
So nobody takes it super seriously, I would say, in, in that, you know, in a geometric sense that there is something rotating or anything like that, right? Because, and that's why, you know, all these public science books go on about oh, it's intrinsic rotation or things, weird things like that. Like they have to resort to something that is weird uh, and, and, and intuitive because mathematically you, you can only draw analogies because you can really in, into it that you live in, that you are in a three sphere and you're quotienting down to a two sphere. It's just uh, it's just hard to into it for a, for a, for a human mind. So anyway, yeah, um, I'm trying to see if we can because uh, it's getting late and I'm I'm personally super tired. So I I, I mean I would go on forever, but uh, I feel like <laughs> I, I, I should I should uh, get us some slack here. Um, so I w I'm wondering if we could end with some thought that is thrown for all of us to comment on or to give our um oh and and then we have to come back to the polls because uh we've been we've been monitoring the the bi weekly theme polls oh i see some i see some stats uh there's some distribution of topics uh it's looking interesting so uh but now before that that will be just the closing uh of the live stream but uh before that it's the the last uh, well the last thought I want well the last thought the last uh, not even question like open topic to yeah. to follow uh, I will want you to get into the um, to understand more closely the relationship between okay uh, when you uh, get to a a, a specific non Euclidean space for example in your metric your uh, for example the the classic thing of saying the your um your a triangle uh, um the sum of its angles stops being 180. yeah um i know that that in in machine learning the angles of the vectors for example in in uh, in chat gpt are one a, a word like italy and a word like uh potato each of them has a, a relationship between them in terms of angle and direction and stuff so I want to more closely understand what's the consequence of uh, having a different metric and then a different uh, amount of uh, uh, sum of angles in triangles yeah. with the, what this kind of machine learning can, uh, is going to do with uh, those vectors when it sums them or, or subtracts them to get uh, comparisons, uh, comparisons and conclusions, for example. Um, uh, three group one brown uh, very recently i haven't watched the oh, videos yeah. but he, uh, it's an ama uh, they have, they have this amazing series on, on transformers and for example a very visual way to to say for example it's um how this works was uh for example uh, it was um aunt and uh uncle and then wife uh, in parallel you know so the it subtracts uh, the relationship in, in male female as you say oh, okay. and then it creates uh, may, uh, mm, wife and then uh, husband for example you know, it creates these uh, interpretations so these kind of things i guess that of course if you use a different kind of non inclusion space this the di uh, dynamics with dynamics with the yeah i'm listening in oh. angles is going to, to affect it so i want to understand that better if it's possible yeah yeah, yeah. I mean, that's interesting. You know, if you have like a, a monarch plus female, does that equal queen? And if you do a monarch minus female, does that equal king? That kind of thing. Yeah. No, I, I was actually, I wish uh, Lyubov um, would be here because she talked about that at some point. She showed me some results about the additivity structure of, of vector representation. Um, mm -hmm. But it's very interesting because we said in the beginning, and this this is something that, I mean, it's just, to be honest, uh, this is just sheer ignorance of not looking into the papers. It is also true that the papers are very inaccessible. So, I mean, I am a bit forgiven for not wanting to just uh, plunge into into those papers. But, um, but it's funny that in this mathematical approach to Transformers paper that is on the Discord, um, they it was super easy for me to understand because I, I could just like the first two pages just define a mathematical system that I'm very familiar with, like some differential equations, some manifolds. And it's like, ah, yeah, I know what I am. And then they said, and they basically, what the model does is this. And I was like, ah, okay, I understand what it is. Obviously I had no idea about the architecture and how exactly it does it, but you know, 
I get the point. But so what they said there, and this we discussed earlier in the live stream today, is that your data your data points are represented as elements on a sphere. So your they are actual points on a sphere. They're sure represented by a vector that is normalized or projected down a sphere or whatever, but technically they are points on a sphere. So this is where the a fine discussion comes in because a point in a, but at the same time you have these additivity constructions of like is a king uh, minus man equal queen or whatever like this kind of uh, relations uh, that seems to be in direct contradiction or is somehow incompatible with having a representation of a sphere because a sphere very explicitly has no additivity structure. I mean, at least not the direct one, not the obvious one. Like if you take vectors and you add them together or subtract them, you're going to fly around. Obviously, you can always normalize at the end and you land back on the sphere. But that seems to me that it, there's no... Like those, those, two, those two structures are not talking to each other nicely, right? Like if you have things on a sphere and you have additivity, and all you do is actually do the additivity on the ambient space and then project down back to sphere. I don't intuitively it seems that, that that's not going to have a nice interpretation. So, so yeah, what the dot product in this case is trying to like measure the way I see it is you have like this one vector and it's enumerating how much of a word agrees with these list of um, concepts. Yeah, you know. And yeah. so it's like, okay, well, like a queen is like, you know, a bit woman, female, a bit, yeah. and then monarch, and then, you know, the rest of the features are minimal. Yeah. Um, so, so when you take a dot product, what you're doing is you're kind of like, you're taking like one vector with its features and trying to measure like how much it overlaps, how much, how much feature overlap it gets with this other, other one. Yeah. So if, you know, if, if this one is, is, zero or this one is one then like they don't overlap on that feature that kind of thing and so what you get is like a measurement of the total amount by which they they overlap on certain features um so the like you can think of it as geometrically you can think of it as angle but like in the space of what features they agree upon that's what um that's what they're they're measuring and in that sense, like, you know, when you have an airy three case, like you have these three words, you know, how much do they mutually agree on, on a certain, um, features, you know, for any component to have a non-zero input into the sum, they would have to agree somewhat on the common feature that is, is in each uh, vector component. Yeah. I just have a really interesting yeah. thing to look at. And, you know, it might be that these, um, that when you compare two words, you know, you do have a, a comparison notion with angle on a sphere, but when you compare three words, all that's out the window, you're just comparing, like, the, the feature in, in their places. Yeah. That, not... That's a good thought for an inquiry, I guess, for, you know, moving forward. I'm really interested in that now. <laughs> Oh yeah, yeah. No, that that's that's something I I have no no good intuitions on, and um, we we did the, in previous concept colliders we did discuss a bunch on uh, whether you know everyone is tacitly assuming that the spaces they they represent the thing their things are actually Euclidean affine spaces or whether they are Euclidean metric spaces or you know metric vector spaces or something like that because. To me, those are very different things. Because if you are in a mm -hmm. vector space, you are absolutely anchored at the origin. Like the origin is something that's immovable. Is it has a very special meaning for your data set, or you know, if you're interpreting the data science aspect of it. Um, but an affine space has no preferred origin, has no reference point, or right. Or you just put, care about yeah clustering in that sense. Yeah, exactly. In an affine sense, you just exactly care about so. Beauty. Put in, put in other words, uh, it's not that you don't have one preferred uh, origin, it's that you're basically equalizing all, all data points as being democratically even. Like they, don't, they, they all live in their pockets. And, and so, so that, that, that's something that I don't have a 
I mean, this is this this was when I when Alex proposed some of the initial questions. I said those are interesting. Let's let's investigate those. But the ones I had of my own that were sort of like splicing together very nicely were exactly this. And to this day, I still don't have a good intuition uh, about this question of whether. Well, in a sense, normalizing to the sphere is like you're forgetting the the origin, and you're just saying okay, everything's equal space from this origin, uh, origin in a democratic sense and well, you just care about less during that sense by by saying these things are close together if they have similar angles sure but then and again you're, you're if you case that's nice so, to the origin. so basically basically curvature means uh semantic bias there it's called in semantic bias there yeah but 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 so if you i mean i take your point and the, and the thing is if imagine that you begin in a vector space then there's only one sphere that you can define. I mean, up to scale, right? But if you're in a fine space where you center your sphere up to scale, is is it changes entirely the clustering. And in particular, if you're dealing with real data, meaning that it's always finite, therefore bounded, therefore you can choose a sphere that is very far away and you can always cluster everything together. So, you know, it's crucially important to me that whether, whether you can assume that your data is coordinate data or your data is vector data. Like to me, these are completely different things. And the problem is that mathematically, you know, the Python code that people will run to write their papers and things like that, looks indistinguishable. Like th there's no way to tell one uh, array from the other because they are just numbers in a list, right? Like there's no, there's no way to tell them apart. And, and so this, is, this makes me quite excited on the one hand that, um, that we are trying to uh, infuse data science with a bit more mathematically rich um, machinery, uh, in a sense, because you know, if you if you have anything like counting, I mean, just I said this last time that we met privately. I'll say it here for the record, I guess. If you have anything that that um, if you have a process that you can interpret, and by interpret I mean that you have a sort of meta scientific or a meta, sorry, meta experimental scientific understanding of that effectively boils down to a counting process um, and you are somehow keeping track of uh, a quantity that is being counted, that is being sort of added up, then things like arithmetic and eventually things like geometry, because you imply the sort of continuity kind of analogy or, or simplification or something, those are reasonable like uh, i don't know if i mean the technicality of how to do things precisely will change obviously but that's always going to make sense uh, at some level or there's going to be some utility there but i'm really fascinated by the situations where it doesn't make sense to do that and in situations where not just that oh uh it's proven it's proving inefficient or diminishing returns from you know two decades of such and such methods and things like that. I mean, sure, that, that's good. That's to follow up. But those methods are giving diminishing returns. They're still kind of like working and they're doing something. So I'm particularly interested when those things don't make sense. Like literally, you cannot uh, express your data as numbers, and it makes it just destroys the the information you have if you does, if you do represent them with numbers. Obviously. In some technical sense, you will always represent, you will always be able to represent some finitary information in terms of numbers, because we know about computational universality. But, but in practice, if you're, for example, I always go back to the same uh, example, but if you were to measure something like color, and you have something that is just defined in terms of color, you might be looking at color as something that is naturally compositional in the same way that quantity is something that is naturally compositional. Like you look at objects and you put them in your hands and you can count them separately and you can do the arithmetic in your head and you have some nice kind of al algebra that you're abstracting from that experience. Similarly, you can abstract an, an algebra of color from the experience of mixing color, either with uh, pigment and paint or with uh, beams of light or whatever, right? There's some sense in which um, color composes with, with, it, with itself or with each other, right? Um, and so it might be that you might want to define uh, an apparatus that, that reads in color, right? It just maybe bends it in some defined hues or something, you know, like, and just says result, you know, outcome of this experiment is, and you just see a color, 
you see it with your eyes uh, okay uh, maybe it has a name it's a symbol okay whatever that color is and so on and you have a sequence of such things you have your usual data structures with those things but and you can have arrays you can have all these operations but instead of having to sum them together or multiply them together or take averages or do dot products and so on now you have to invent what are the natural compositions for the color right and and we know some basic algebra right? if you if you simplify to like primary colors and secondary colors like uh, black white uh, rgb and you know teal yellow and pink or whatever um those uh, those colors um they they follow an algebra you know you do uh, black plus white is white uh, white plus anything is white uh, black plus anything is anything uh, you know red plus blue is whatever you know like uh, you know uh, any any secondary color plus secondary secondary color, color is always white as well like th this kind of there's an algebra there right like this is this is an algebra uh, that is well defined uh, in fact it's uh, characterized by I think I remember it's uh, uh, absorbent element, uh, unit element, associative, and six element, and uh, sorry, eight elements in total. I think that fully characterizes the, the algebra. Anyway, but that's just an anecdotal. But the point is, there is an algebra, so why not just have something that is valued over this algebra, and you know where this algebra is doing the heavy lifting. You know, you have your chips just coding, just sorry, just processing. Uh, you know, red plus blue, blue plus blue, blue blue plus yellow, yellow plus, you know, it's just doing that instead of one plus zero all the time. Um, and so, so that makes sense to me mathematically, even computationally. What I'm fascinated by is in what realistic situation that will come up. Like in what, what kind of phenomena will you have to study and what kind of apparatus will you have to set up so that, so that there is effective science to be done with that, that kind of framework? No idea. This to me is kind of almost like psychedelic mathematics. <laughs> I don't know how to think about it. It's, like, it's weird. I don't know. I don't, I don't even know. So, so yeah. So, so that's uh, yeah the kind of limitation that you run into because of this. Um, uh, yeah, the, the limits of. I mean, I, I flew into this example of mine, but going back to the question, is it's like, what exactly is your space affording you? Like, what mathematically? what exactly is it that you're exploiting out of a coordinate space rather than a vector space? And it's very confusing when you, you learn a paper about, uh, uh, you know, t transformers mathematically, they tell you, Oh yeah, the, your, your data points are always living on a sphere. It's like always on a sphere. And then soon later you learn that, Oh, there's this rule where you can add things together. And like, okay. So then, you know, uh, and in fact, I mean, maybe I can report this live because this was a this was eye opening to me this past couple of weeks when Lyubov was here in Madrid with me. Uh, we, we had a very intense time. We were working a lot because we're both very busy with other things, but we're also together and we try to make the most of the time. But he said, she said one thing that I was quite shocked by, or perhaps I mean a bit surprised. She said that maybe it's not so surprising as, after all. But she said that data science works a lot like. Um, like craftsmanship that essentially there's a lot of a lot of techniques a lot of tools laying around there's like a big workshop and and then you know when wood comes into the workshop there's some like new batch of like data sets like people just start, start to like throw stuff at these things and just do things with them but there's no good science of of data this i mean data science is not so much of a science apparently according to her and this is a someone who is a you know phd in data yeah, science it's, it's it's one of the things that I've, I've been impressed by when when learning it, and the same the same thing with uh, like in general in several places in in computer science that they don't they have to study what neural networks are doing. Like it, it's not I guess it's not evident. At the, at, I mean, of course, for me it wasn't at first sight, but of course it's like you are using um, you are you are designing some systems and you are running them and. The, the thing is that they end up being another, other kind of, of um, organisms that you have to study. So you design them to do, to perform several tasks and stuff, but then you have to perform psychology on them. So it's uh, it's very interesting. And um, but precisely that complexity, I guess, it's it's the my main hope that that. Uh, many of these computer tools, uh, tools in computer sciences.
uh, are going to be uh, helpful for reproducing organisms mm. like biological organisms. Yeah. They, they are they have such a, a big complexity on their own, even with simple rules. Uh, uh, wing to 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 Warfront project that they can they, can, they we have, we have to understand them to study them in um, greater science only to understand what they are doing in the inside. So. Yeah, definitely. No, no. Uh, people were calling it. I don't know. At, at Warfront, we call it like um, machine neuroscience. It's like the yeah. the br machine brain surgery and things like that. <laughs> like the, to probe individual neurons, neural, neuronal layers to see what they're up to. Yeah. If you can interpret what they're up to at all. Yeah. That's a kind of a black art, I would imagine. Hmm. Yeah, it's, it's a very similar problem. All right, everyone. So I think we can uh, close the stream by showing how the poll is going. So the few viewers that are left with us, uh, thanks for uh, making it to the end. Uh, you're a hero. I mean, this has been quite a long and a, and a dense one, but um, I very much enjoyed it. I mean, uh, I found myself with... Uh, you know, uh, mathematicians, and then Alex came in to save, just running, running wild into, into geometry, uh, pure. So, right. So, just a reminder, everyone. Uh, I'll share. I'll share a link again, uh, in case uh, you don't see the updates on the chat. You can. Uh, oops. Sorry about this message. Um, you can join our Discord by following that link. Uh, for those of you who are not aware, that's where all the interaction happens. You will be up to date with all. All the all the messaging and all the announcements uh, but finally we are um, about to decide uh, on the upcoming bi-weekly topics uh, and so mm, please uh, follow the link and uh, visit the discord this particular channel bi-weekly theme uh, you will find the, la the latest message you will see this uh, big poll um, yeah invite everyone to vote uh, you can see that currently chemistry and mathematics uh, are leading, um, followed closely by, so Q is, well, co-leading with, uh, no, sorry, followed closely by, for example, K, which is metaphysics, okay, or G, which is uh, information science. Um, so I'm very glad to see that chemistry suddenly, uh, I feel like our community does have a sense of multidisciplinary balance because uh, I, I wanted to, I wanted to uh, have some chemistry because it's been a long time and uh, uh, it, I, I'm always curious to learn more chemistry and, with, and uh, to have some chemist people with, chemi with chemistry background or a bit more, more experience with the chemi chemistry community come uh, say a few things. Um, I'm very glad to see that, uh, you, know, uh, you know, you ask and you, might, you shall be given. I mean, the people, people voted for chemistry. But I mean, uh, a lot more people have to vote still. I mean, this doesn't represent even like maybe... 20, 30 percent of the active uh, commenters on the on the on the on the, on the Discord. So, uh, ooh, I, I see a I see a ticking number here. D gaming is just uh, becoming uh, now now leading. Uh, yeah, close uh, trade for chemistry. I'm interested in, you know, yeah. how well, you know how why are uh, electron orbitals for molecules so difficult to compute? Um, you know that you have the model for the orbitals for a hydrogen atom being all these spheres and lobes and mm. uh, s orbitals p orbitals and the toroidal ones as well and um, but when you when you have a, a bunch of molecule a molecule of uh, several atoms um what what you know how are uh, electron orbitals computed there and um i understand that the problem is very difficult Although I don't know why, I don't know much about it. Just that you mean is. you mean when you have to compute the orbitals for molecules, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah that that be that be interesting. Yeah, I think it probably has to do with the. I mean, if I am to guess, the differential equation, so Schrodinger's equation for for interacting electrons. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know exactly what, what assumptions they, they apply, but, but in a technical sense, these are nonlinear. So yeah. in an in a ODE sense, so in a PDE sense, these are non. So they're not going to be like closed form solutions that are like easily predictable, but they should be like numerically solvable, yeah. I would guess, maybe. That's, that was yeah, that's question. been a big industry. I, I, I don't have a lot of experience with that, but I know that it has been a big industry, like uh, quantum chemistry is basically that industry, right? I go for uh, this idea. 
um, yeah, no, it'll, it'll be cool to see. So maybe we have uh, chemistry and gaming because I mean it's uh, it's really uh, for gaming. I'm interested in, or for my own interests are including a four dimensional reality, a virtual reality. Let's say, Ooh, or yeah. you know, um, puzzle games in the fourth dimension. Um, oh yeah, those are cool. Yeah, things I want to. Did you play? I love that. Yeah, I, I've seen several. I've been a few, I've seen a, a few, well, at least one uh, a video game or well, project of video game on YouTube, uh, um, designing uh, like non Euclidean geometries and, and uh, like you have you have to play in the it's, it's Yeah, like, yeah, these uh, are cool. Xeno Rogue or huh? Hyper. Which one? Yeah, Hi Zeno Hyper something. Um, hyperbolic. Hyperbolica. Um, Hyperbolica. Yeah, cool. yeah, yeah. Hyperbolica. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Oh, that, yeah. Hyperbolica. Yeah. Yeah. Hyperbolica. The the guy who made made Hyperbolica has several 4D games. Um, so I think Hyperbolic Hyperbolica was 4D, I think, but I was also exploring other geomet like hyperbolic geometries. Is now. that the one where it's where there's a he's playing golf? Yeah, that's or the new one. That's the newer one. Yes, the, he has a golf okay. one. Uh, the engine just is built a few games in the engine. Um, but there was one that was that was a kind of a navigational game. So it's almost like it felt like it was a an exploration game, and you were getting slices of I mean three D slices. You, that might be Magikure. That mean what? Well, it's sorry? like a Magikure. I'm the, butchering it, but it's a the, it's a Japanese word for my garden. Oh, and oh, I don't know. That's that's uh, Mark Ten Brosh. Okay, creating that. Interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, um, but uh, yeah, and the, and the point of the of the topics is also the uh, recommendations. So I'll point everyone to the recommendations uh, channels. We have a lot of recommendations. I'm gonna give a live recommendation when I finish the series. I will post it uh, properly. I'll make a proper sort of written recommendation for this. Uh, the, the series is called uh, Scavengers Realm, uh, Rain. Sorry, not Realm. Scavengers Rain. Uh, you've seen it, Alex? I, I recommend it to you. Oh, really? <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. The, I forgot. Yes. Yeah, yeah, like, like, uh, and uh, we we watch it in in uh, like before moving to to Madrid. In fact, uh, Daniel and I, I mean, ah. we definitely loved it. I, I recommend it to you all. Yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, now, 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 that, now that you mention it, because Lyubov, when she was here, she mentioned it again. I just I remember now, but I just forgot. Yeah, I, yeah. I never got to it. I remember actually seeing it, and and your description and saying, okay, I need to watch this, and then. It was, yeah, it yeah, was yeah. It's and it's and it's amazing. It. It's the kind of thing that that some film people will love. Oh. Like, <laughs> I mean, it just I've only seen three episodes. Uh, that's why I'm reserving my full recommendation. I mean, I'm I'm very very much very very likely to give the full recommendation because even at, at three episodes, um, it's probably already in terms of sci-fi. It's probably already my favorite sci-fi already in like in many years. <laughs> it's like. Um, just because it speaks to me so much, like this, this, uh, yeah, yeah. this sort of hard sci-fi, hard pushing into the directions where imagination and uh, speculation can run wild. So push hard into those, but otherwise be like grounded by the reality of you exactly, know, you're, exactly. you're stranded in a yeah. planet, whatever. And you know, uh, yeah, it's no Holmes barred imagination on what what type of biologies could. There yeah. be an yeah. alien world. Yeah, exactly. And what type of symbiotic relationships yeah. involved? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. That's what I was going to say. The, the amount of creativity no that that, that uh, biosphere has. I mean, yeah. it's it's yeah. amazing. No, no, it's. it's but, I mean, like, I'm really eager to like exploring like the world that it's pre being presented to me. Like, super, super interesting. But just the from the first five minutes or ten minutes of the first episode, I knew that I was going to love it because I I love yeah. these movies to death. Like the that was the feeling. Like the 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 hard sci-fi. I mean, it's almost like you can smell it. You know, when you start watching this, like you can smell the the the, the people in the in the writing room. They're like, no, no, we are we're not crossing the boundary here. We're actually like, and it's almost this unspoken contract with the viewer. It's like they they lend you their hand and they say, yes, we are in the same universe. You know, this universe that you're so familiar with and so you know you've dedicated so many hours of your life to understanding better. You can 
carry over all that all that intuition into this world, but we're gonna push in directions that are you know properly speculative, and you have like pockets of things that are not well understood, and you know how you know things may be emergent and symbiotic and things like that. Um, but mm. I, I just love these kinds of things. That's why there are some movies that are not um, like super popular because they are not great movies or they are not like the best of for one or the other direction. But they have this feature of like. They are grounded. The, everything is believable. Everything is actually yeah. feasible. In and the sense. the uh, the music the music is very simple, oh, but it's great. Super it, effective. It's, yeah. it, it, it's great next to the rest. Of, and uh, and the sound of, design. Uh, the sound design. Yeah. 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 Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And one of the things that, uh, aside from the amount of creativity, uh, another kind of great ingredient to me to science fiction is the amount of references to already in development uh, technologies because I, I'm not going to, to make any spoiler, but very genetically said, um, uh, fungi, uh, compu uh, in co adding, adding fungi to computing uh, systems. Uh, 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 it's already being developed and oh, I yeah. learned about this after being the, uh, watching the series. So I learned oh, right. uh, cool. recently developing science thanks to it. So it's... Yeah, it's cool. It's, it's cool. cool. Oh. Very cool. So yeah, it's good to have the live recommendation. See, uh, great minds think alike, and they they also like similar shows, I guess. Um, all right, peeps, that was uh, that was a pleasure as usual. I'm gonna uh, just close the stream over here. Uh, thanks everyone for joining us for another one. Uh, yeah. But yeah, uh, I'll see you all soon. Dugan, Alex, Anmo. Uh,